All right, now, in Exodus chapter 40, you know, there's a lot of chapters in the book of Exodus that you might think are kind of boring chapters. You know, they might be kind of hard to plow through. But there's a lot that you can learn from, from all these chapters. And you shouldn't try to just read over it too quickly. But we see here in the beginning of chapter 40, you know, in the first 15 verses, God is explaining. And he's kind of just recapping everything because there's a lot of more detail in, in earlier chapters of how the tabernacle is supposed to be set up and how it's supposed to be raised. And in the first 15 chapters, God explains exactly how he wants things to be. He has a design. He has a plan and says, you know, this needs to be here. The, you know, the, the, the altar needs to be before the, you know, in, in a certain place. Everything needs to be the way that he has designed it. And one thing that really stuck out to me was, um, you know, in verse 16 of Exodus 40, the Bible says, Thus did Moses according to all that the Lord commanded him. So did he. Now, wouldn't that be a great, that's a great testimony of Moses, but think about you in your personal life. If, if you could have it said about you or written about you that according to all that the Lord commanded you, so did you. That's something, that, that's a great testimony for Moses. And, and that's something I wish could be said about me. You know, it is, hey, everything that God commanded me, that's what I'm doing. And Moses is a great example of this. Moses did... So many things. You know, God commanded Moses to do all these, all these works. Now, he was a sinner. He wasn't perfect. And I think probably his biggest failure was at the waters of Meribah, but it, which, which prevented him from actually crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land. But over and over again, I mean, God had a lot of commandments for Moses to do. And Moses had a great job of leading. And Moses just, every time God told him to do something, he would just obey. He would just do it. You, you know, the Lord would tell him to do something, and he would do it. Everything pertaining to the tabernacle, we see right here, everything that God commanded him to do, he did it. And we see that in verses, in verses 19, 21, 23, 25, 27, 29, and verse 32 in this chapter all end with, as the Lord commanded Moses. And I was reading through this chapter, just, it just you know, keeps seeing it over and over again that, that Moses did this. He set this up as the Lord commanded Moses. He set this up as the Lord commanded Moses. Everything that he was doing was as the Lord had commanded him. Every aspect of the temple, every, of the tabernacle was according to God's commandment. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things to be learned from this. There's so many great truths and why it's so important for Moses to have done exactly what God said. And the first point I want to make is that we need to obey God's commandments, all of God's commandments in the Bible, and it's regardless of whether or not you even understand why. You know, you, you receive commandments. You think about your children. I think about my children. They don't always understand the reason why I have certain rules for them. They don't always get it, you know, but it's always for their benefit. You know, we have rules that we put in place for our children so that they can grow up to do what's right and to walk righteously. Now, they don't always get why, but they have to understand that, no, when, when mom or dad command you to do this, then you better obey. And us as children of God, we are God's children and He's our Father. He's given us a set of commandments. Now, we don't always have the proper understanding that we, that we need to, but we need to at least have that first step of obedience and say, you know what? I may not understand why this is true. It may not make sense to me, but if the Bible says it, if God gives us that commandment, then I'm just going to follow it. I'm just going to obey it. And um, we need to take... you know, And I'm sure... Moses probably didn't have the full understanding of all of the symbolic references and everything that went into the tabernacle and all of its design. But you know what? He obeyed God. He did exactly what, what, what he needed to do and what he was told to do. Now, in, um, in 1 Samuel 15, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, 22, it says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. This was spoken unto King Saul. Right? King Saul not, decided not to obey all of God's commandments. King Saul took it upon himself to offer a sacrifice when, when it was time for the battle. They were about ready to go out to war. And he was waiting on Samuel and Samuel didn't show up. 
But see, God had ordained that the priest's job was the one that was supposed to be offering those sacrifices. It was not the job of the king. It was not the job of someone from the tribe of Benjamin to be offering up those sacrifices unto the Lord. And you might say, well, yeah, but he was doing a good thing. He was making an offering to the Lord. You know, he's making a sacrifice. He was trying to do what's right. But that's not the way God saw it. God said, no, you disobeyed my commandment. You disobeyed me when you took it upon yourself to, to fill in a role that wasn't given unto you. And God took away the kingdom because of that, because he didn't listen to him. And the Bible calls that rebellion. When you, just, when you know God's commandment and you hear it and you say, you know what, no, I got a better way. Or no, I'm going to take this into my own hands and I'm going to do it a different way than God commanded it. That's rebellion. You're rebelling against, against the Lord. He says rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And, and you know, there's serious repercussions for that. So when you, under, when you hear God's word, whether you understand it or not, whether you think you have a better way of doing things, you better just do it the way that he lays out for us in the Bible. And of course, there is a reason for all of God's commandments. There is a reason for it. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, we might not understand it, but you ought to try to gain that understanding. You know, the understanding and wisdom is going to help you probably to, to be able to obey it even better going forward. But just because you don't understand something is not an excuse to disregard God's word. And there's way too much of that going, going on in today's churches. And that's, um, you know, we see in Exodus 40 was setting up the tabernacle. That's basically the church, right? That's, yeah. that's the way God wanted things to be designed in his church. God cares about how a church is set up. He cares about what goes on in church. He cares about the way the, the, way the service is run. He cares about all, every aspect of the service. So, you, you know, we ought to make sure that we are, are, going, are, we are conducting our services the way that he has laid out for us to do. And you notice in verses 1 through 15 where he's given Moses, you know, I want this to be done this way and set it up this way. He didn't just say, okay, go ahead and just set up. Here's all the stuff that you need. Go ahead and just set it up however you want. You know, because God doesn't really care about, about the little things, right? Those just minor details. You know, there's a lot of detail. You, anyone who's read the book of Exodus knows that there is a lot of detail going into exactly how things were supposed to be. God cares. You know, if God didn't care about the details, he wouldn't have told him exactly how to do everything. He would have just said, eh, do whatever comes into your heart and, and that'll be good enough. But no, one of the, see, one of the reasons that, that that made such a big deal is there was a pattern of the tabernacle in heaven. And God said, I want you to make it just the, the, way, the same way that it is up here. And he gave them all the specific details. Now, you think about, there's a lot of stories, there's a lot of examples of people who did not follow exactly God's commandments. You think of Nadab and Abihu. They were Aaron's sons. And God told them, hey, this is the incense. This is what you're going to offer before the Lord. This is what is acceptable. This is what your job is to do. And he said, you and he told them explicitly not to offer any strange fire, not to, not to bring anything of your own. But that's what they did. They, they, you know, they, they decided, you know what, we're going to serve God this way. We're going to offer some strange fire. And I honestly don't believe that their, their heart was in the wrong place. I think they wanted to serve the Lord. I don't think they were thinking of themselves as being very rebellious. I don't think they looked at themselves and thought, you know what, I'm going to show God. I'm going to put the wrong, the wrong fire in here. I don't think they thought that at all. I think they thought, hey, we're going to do you know, extra. We're, we're going to give this maybe more expensive offering or, or whatever it may be. But they died as a result of that sin. God said, no, look, that's not what I told you to do. You're offering some strange fire before me. And he took their lives. That's pretty serious. You think about... You think about um, disobeying some of God's commandments in your own life. I mean, we're all sinners, but if you think about God just says, okay, I'm just going to take your life now. You're done. Because it's such a serious sin. And you think of Uzzah was the same way with, um, you know, he wasn't supposed to touch the ark, but they brought the ark in on a, on a cart and it was about to fall. Hey, he was trying to do a good thing. He was trying to save it, right, from in the ground. Again, broke the commandment of the Lord. Not obeying and not following that closely, too. See, a lot of churches today, oh, you're so legalistic. Oh, why do you look so close? You know, God doesn't care about that. God only looks at the heart. God only cares about the heart. Now, that's a lie. That's not true. Now, maybe the most important thing is your heart. 
I'm not going to argue with that. Yes, getting your heart right is the most important thing. But that is not the only thing that is important. Yeah. God wouldn't have taken these men's lives if all that matters is what was in their heart. You think about Cain. Same thing, right? Abel brought forth a sacrifice, a, a, an animal, to, to give a blood sacrifice unto the Lord. And what did Cain do? He brought the works of his hands. He brought the best of what he can do, but it wasn't what God had appointed. It wasn't what God had commanded or what God had said. And it was not respected. But you have today's churches, they don't seem to have a problem with the Cains and the Nadabs and the Bayhus of this world because they're saying, okay, well, yeah, just worship God however you want, serve Him. If your heart's right, then everything's good. And that's not the way it is. You know, they're going to tell you that um, <clears throat> all that matters, again, is serving God with your heart. But um, if that's all that mattered, then Nadab and Bayhus would not have died. Now turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Now one of the reasons God takes these things so seriously is because there's also, besides just, I mean, being obedient, of course, is extremely important, but, but one of the reasons behind being obedient is that, and with God's laws and with God's rules, is that there's often a greater truth that's being taught that's inside of His commandments. Um, for example... The institution of marriage, right? God is ordained, and Ephesians 5 spells out how marriage isn't just the law for, um, you know, like between a man and a wife, which is that's extremely important, and we need to, to make sure that we're adhering that, adhering our proper roles as husband and wife, that we're, we don't get divorced, you know, because all of these things that God has commanded us regarding just being married, it ties in with Christ and the church. See, there's also there's a bigger picture to that, and there's a bigger understanding when you understand, hey, if I decide to get divorced from my, from my husband or from my wife, that's like Christ splitting from the church. There's a much greater truth to be learned there in that we can't just, just disregard God's commandments because we think of, oh, there's something going on in my life that, you know, that would try to you try to make excuses to justify sinning and making it you know breaking the commandment of the Lord and again a lot of, a lot of probably well-intentioned people end up sinning without even realizing the greater picture and the and the bigger repercussions of this and the 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 blasph you know it's the blaspheming God's God's message and His words that's associated with all of um, with with all these rules and His laws. Now, in, um, in Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to see how, how, how the tabernacle was set up, taught a greater message, and taught a greater truth that was not just because God wanted things to be a certain way. You know, there, there was a lot more meaning behind it. Look at verse number 1 of Hebrews 9. The Bible reads, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak Particularly, so he's basically describing everything that's in that was in that first tabernacle, everything that that was ordained back then, and how Moses set it up. Look at verse six. It says, "Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself." And for the errors of the people, we're going to see now the significance of all of this, all of the, the ordinances that they did, all of the, the way that God planned and laid it out. Verse number eight says, the Holy Ghost is signifying. So the Holy Ghost is saying that this is, this is what this means, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that, that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, 
Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once unto the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. We see how important that, that first tabernacle was and the design of it. It was a picture of Jesus Christ to come and all the sacrifices that they offered and everything that they did in offering those sacrifices and the blood being shed was all a picture as a figure for the time then present to point to Christ who was to come and to die once for all that his blood might be shed to take away the sins of the whole world to offer that e to the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, if they decided to, to do things their own way and to stray from God's commandments, that would totally mess up the picture that God was trying to create and the truth that he had inherent to those commandments, those laws about Christ coming in the future, which is just going to cause more, um, more confusion and, and false doctrine when you start straying from God's commandments because there's, there's that greater meaning, that greater impact. Now, our churches, the church like, like Faithful Word Baptist Church, your church, and Verity Baptist Church, and Word of Truth Baptist Church, we take this seriously. We try to do everything in our service as God commanded, right? As the Lord commanded, that's what we're trying to do. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13 says, We have an altar whereof they have no right, in verse 10, We have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp, Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And this is, this is kind of signifying, you know, the end of Jerusalem being that continuing city, whereas we're seeking that heavenly Jerusalem. That's what we're looking for um, in these days. We're looking for the heavenly Jerusalem, um, to come down from heaven. And verse 15 says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate forget not for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Now we could see here, you know, we, we may not have the specific detailed outline that Moses had for the tabernacle for our local church. You know, he doesn't say, you know, the, the, the chairs need to be set up in this certain way um, with as much detail. However, um, and, and part of the reason for that, you know, our bodies are the tabernacles since we have the Holy Ghost and um, the local church is part of the body of Christ. But we have plenty of information from Scripture on how the local church ought to operate. And what I just read there in Hebrews 13, it says um, in verse 15, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. One of the things that we do in our service is we sing praises unto God. And it, and it says here in Hebrews 13, 15, to offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. And a lot of the songs that we sing, a lot of the hymns that we sing, are, they're doctrinal hymns, and they give thanks. A lot of them are just giving thanks for salvation, giving thanks for God's mercy and his grace. And um, that's one of the reasons. You know, there's a lot of reasons why we have our services set up the way that they are. And... Um, you know, you think of you think about how other churches don't don't um, they don't care as much about it. They don't think so hard about about how God wants things to be laid out. And you think about why don't we have rock and roll in church, right? You think about like most churches these days are are patterned after the world, for one. They, they and and it's this whole philosophy, and it's what it is. It's a, it's this vain uh, philosophies of the world that draw people away from following God's commandments and they just think, oh, okay, well, you know what, how should we serve God? And they just, just think of all the worldly ways to do it, right? They think of, well, what do people like? You know, when people come to church, well, we like to have this rock and roll music. We make it like a concert and we'll, you know, we'll have Starbucks in the auditorium and we'll have, you know, all these things just to make it comfortable for people and to bring them in. 
But the Bible says um, in Romans 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And when you go to church, hey, we're not to be conformed to this world. And one of the things you learn by going to church, by hearing the preaching, is how to be transformed. We need to be transformed in our daily lives. We don't want to be part of this world. The Bible says that, um, that the love of, love of the world is, is, um, is enmity with God. And that, you know, that, that we shouldn't love the things of this world. <laughs> we shouldn't love the things of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind to prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. And you think about other aspects of, of church, you know, we, we pray, we, um, we sing congregational songs, as it says in um, Psalm twenty-two, twenty-two: I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And then, you know, and there's a reason why so much Bible is read in the sermons. It's not just, you know, we're not just trying to give our opinion on things. We're trying to expound God's word. The preacher, a good preacher is going to be one who stands up that could give you a lot of scripture and can prove from scripture and say, hey, this is why we believe what we believe. You know, it's not just my opinion. It's not just just something that I think is gonna is is good for you. And it's not just a self help, right? This is teaching you God's word and God's commandments, and say, you know what? This is why we believe it because the Bible says right here, um, you know, in Luke four seventeen, it says, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, it's talking about Jesus. He found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. We see Jesus Christ himself taking the Bible reading scripture and then expounding it unto the people and this is exactly what needs to be going on in church and it needs to be taken directly from god's word and just the expounding of god's word and you think about even not just within the church service but going out and, and doing soul winning and winning souls to christ as uh, pastor menes preached yesterday it was a great sermon on on getting out there and, and on the the great commission right fulfilling that great commission is is you know, the reason why we do these things is because they're commanded from the Bible. It's exactly what Jesus Christ has told us to do, and that's what we're going to do. Now, we've looked primarily at the tabernacle and the church being run appropriately in a certain way, but this truth can be applied to all aspects of our life and to all of God's commandments. You know, don't, don't take what God says lightly. You know, if it wasn't important, he wouldn't have said it at all. If, if it didn't have that much of a meaning, then, then he wouldn't have written it down and preserved it throughout all generations. It wouldn't be in his eternal word if it was something that didn't really matter. And don't let other people discourage you, get you down, say, and, you know, because they'll attack you and say, oh, you know, you really believe that? Or, or no, that's, you know, they'll try to explain it away. So that, that's just, that was for old times, you know, things are different. Our culture is different. God's word doesn't change. That's right. God's law doesn't change. His commandments don't change. We ought to have that heart of Moses. Moses was a great man. I mean, he took, it didn't matter. And Moses and Abraham, you think about Abraham, you know, God told Abraham to go and offer up Isaac, his son. And what did, did Abraham argue with him? Did Abraham go and try to do something else? Or did Abraham go and say, well, I'm going to offer this animal instead of my son? No, he just, he heard what God said. And he says, I'm going to do it. Now, obviously, there's a lot of meaning behind that. Again, um, that, that, that extra meaning about uh, the symbol, symbol, symbolism of Christ to come was, was a, a huge picture of, of, of that offering of Isaac. But that, that dedication to God, that willingness to offer truly your whole self. And if God tells you to do something, which he has told us to do many things in the Bible, to be selfless and say, you know what, I'm just going to obey 
and and to understand that you know just getting that obedience part down that's better than any sacrifice that you could bring and say yeah but i put you know a thousand dollars in the offering plate god if you're disobeying god's commandments He's not going to care at all about the fact that you threw some money in the plate. That offering or that, so you say, no, but that really hurt. You know, it took a lot for me to get that together. And my family's really struggling as a result of, of making this great sacrifice to God. God says, look, it's better to just obey than it is to sacrifice. Now, it doesn't mean don't ever sacrifice, but look, make sure you got your priorities straight. Obey the commandments first. Make sure you're walking right according to God's eyes first. Hey, then keep bring, bringing in the sacrifices, bring in the offerings, and that'll be well-pleasing in his sight. But it's not going to be well-pleasing if we're not listening and obeying to what God has for us. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Lord, I pray that you please help us all to read your words intently and, um, and closely and not to make excuses as to why we're not going to follow your commandments, dear Lord. Help us to have a heart like Moses, who's a very humble man, dear Lord. He submitted himself to your will. And that's, that's step number one, is just, is just making sure that we're humble, that we don't have a proud attitude, that we're not haughty and um, rebellious, dear Lord. Help us all to have soft hearts that would be meek and humble and ready to receive your words, ready to receive your commandments. And as Moses did, that when we see that you command us to do something, dear Lord, that we would just do it and, um, and not, not even have to think twice about it, but we would obey you as, with, with full faith that you're a loving Father for us, dear God, that you know what's best for us and that we can just have that faith and trust in you that we'll just obey what you have for us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.